Okay. So uh, today I want to discuss a little bit about uh, one of the ways of constructing symbolic dynamics, symbolic models for uniformly hyperbolic diffeomorphisms, and this is known as the method of pseudo orbits. And it is, uh, the way it's presented here, it's due to Bowen. The original method, as I mentioned to you yesterday, due to Sinai, is called the method of successive approximations. Actually, if you look at the website of the, of the conference, I, I put some lecture notes there that have much more than, than I will discuss here. And in particular, it has a small discussion about this method of successive approximations, if you want to learn a little bit more about that. OK, so what is the method of pseudo-orbits? For simplicity, let me assume that we have uh, in a nozzle of diffeomorphism on a surface. So let f from m2 to m2 be in a nozzle of diffeom. And what do I mean by that? I mean that the tangent bundle of M has a, that exists a continuous DF invariant decomposition TM equals to ES plus EU and there exists constants, a C positive and a lambda between 0 and 1, such that when you get a vector in this ES, what you see is a contraction under the action of the derivative, and what you see for vectors in EU is an expansion, so such that dFn of Vs is smaller than or equal to C lambda to the n Vs, and to see expansion for EU is the same thing as to see contraction if you pre-iterate your vector. So df minus n of u is less than or equal to c times lambda to the n vu. And here is for every n greater than or equal to 0 and vectors vs in es and vu in eu. Okay? So uh, what, I, what this says is that at the linear level, what you see is expansion and contraction. What I want to, to do now is to introduce charts that are more suitable for understanding the behavior of F. First of all, I want to see the same behavior, the same expansion and contraction behavior for F itself, not for only the derivative. And also, why do I consider charts? Because I prefer to work in Euclidean spaces than in these abstract manifolds. So the first step is, uh, it, it's actually a simplification uh, for the proof, is that I can always assume that this C here is, is, small, is smaller than 1. So I can always assume, for actually, that this C here is equal to 1. So this is what we call an adapted metric, and I will leave as an exercise to you to show that if you have an nose of diffeomorphism, then you can find an equivalent metric to the remaining metric that you are considering, for which this inequality for this new metric holds, but with c equals to 1. So there exists an adapted metric and I can put like three bars here to, to make the difference for the, the metric that we are considering on the manifold on M. And what do I mean by that? I mean that the same inequality holds but with c equals to 1. This is just to simplify the calculations that we are going to do soon. So df, or actually I can put, I can call this star. And I can say that star holds with c equals to 1. Okay, so for, for now on, we assume that the metric that we are considering is adapted. It's adapted for the diffeomorphism that we are considering. And as I told you, what I want is that I want to construct uh, charts 
that are easier to understand the behavior of F itself. And to construct charts, the first thing that we want to do is to, to, to make a change of coordinates for the derivative such that the derivative itself is a, a looks like a map from R2, R2 to R2, which is expanding and contracting. So for that, let me introduce a linear map. So for every x in M, call ES and EU be unit vectors in ESX and EUX. So this is a unit vector in the contracting direction. This is a unit vector in the expanding direction. And we define a linear map from R2 to TXM by well, to define a linear map, we just have to say what it does with a basis of R2. I'm going to send the first canonical vector to ES and the second one to U. So C of X, getting this vector here, and it's sending to, well, you have here EXM. It's sending to ESX, and it's sending the other vector to EUX, okay? So I claim that this, this change of coordinates of the tangent space of M makes, when you, when you consider the map DF, you what, what you're going to see is a hyperbolic matrix. So, lemma. What it means to see DFX in the system of coordinates, well, first you iterate with respect to Cx. So you come from R2 to the tangent space of x. Then you apply the derivative. So you come to the tangent space of f of x. And then you have to apply the inverse of the linear transformation at the point f of x, which is C of f of x minus 1. So then you come back to R2. And the lemma is that when you write this thing, what you see is a map from R2 to R2. It is a, it is a linear map, and it can be written like this, where A is smaller than or equal to the constant contraction, to the contraction constant lambda, and B is bigger than or equal to lambda to the minus 1. Okay? So there are many things here. First of all, is that I'm saying that these two vectors are eigenvectors and the eigenvalues associated to them, one of them is smaller than one in absolute value, the, all, the other is bigger than one in absolute value. And the proof is actually quite easy. You just see what this composition makes, what, how this composition acts on the vector. So what that happens when you apply first C of X here, well, by definition, I'm sending it to ES of X. And what does the derivative do to ES of X? Well, I know that the decomposition is DF invariant. So ES of X has to go to the direction of ES of F of X, right? So it is a multiple of this. How much? Well. You apply this, you take the absolute value of it, and what, you, what remains is this direction. So the image of this is this. And then when you compose with the inverse of CF of X, what you get is that this vector here goes back to 1, 0. So the multiple of this vector goes to DFX, ESX, 1, 0. So conclusion, 1, 0 is an eigenvector, and this is the eigenvalue. By assumption, since my metric is adapted, this thing here is smaller than or equal to lambda. This is equal to A, the A over there. And this is smaller than or equal to lambda. And this is the proof, okay? So what we did is that at a linear level, we are able to find changes of coordinates that make the F look like a hyperbolic matrix. But what I want to do now is to, is to get the same thing 
for f itself, not for df. So for that, I have to find changes of coordinates that come from R2, not to the tangent space, but to the manifold itself. Correct? So how do I do that? Well, since I'm already in the tangent space, how do I go to the manifold? I can just consider exponential maps. So assume or take epsilon small enough such that all the exponential maps are well defined in a small rectangle around zero in the tangent space of x. So as let this such that these guys are, for example, I can I can uh, require that they are diffeomorphisms onto their images. with Lipschitz constant at most two. Why? Because I know that the derivative at zero is the identity. So if I take epsilon small enough, then I can control the Lipschitz constant of these maps, okay? So I'm going to define what is known as the Lyapunov chart at x. And it's just a map from R2 to the manifold. And how do I do? Well, I have a map from R2 already to the unit, uh, to the tangent space. So I just compose of the exponential map. So this map here is just the composition of C of X with the exponential map at X, okay? So my goal now is to pass from the linear behavior of the derivative to a nonlinear behavior of the map itself. And we have the following. So if epsilon is small enough, or the following holds for every epsilon is small enough, What it is to see f in this system of coordinates? Well, it is first to compose psi x. So you come from r from a subset of r2 to the manifold. Then you compose with f. Then you compose with the inverse of psi f of x. So let me give a name to this map. This map is f sub x. So the claim is that if epsilon is small enough, then this composition is well defined. in minus epsilon epsilon square and it actually it is a small perturbation of this composition here so what do I mean by that I mean that you can write this thing as a u b v plus some map h of u v where Let's say the C2 norm of H is smaller than epsilon, okay? Okay, so why is that true? Well, because when you calculate the derivative at, at zero of this guy, what you get is exactly this. So if you are taking epsilon small enough, what happens with the map itself? The map itself is close to its derivative, so you can control the error term. Okay, so there is no secret here. What actually turns out is that you can get the same result if you change f of x by a nearby point y. So this is uh, important for what you are going to discuss soon, which is the graph transform method. So actually, I can get a better result than this. So let me put lemma. This is lemma one. lemma 2 
and this is lemma three. So the following holds for delta is small enough. So if now I want to, to make a change of coordinates that does not go from x to f of x, but goes to x from x to a nearby point to f of x. So if the distance of f of x to y is smaller than delta, then when I see f in the coordinates x and y, and let me give a name to this, let me call this f of x sub y, this map here, then this map is well defined and can be written as f of x, y, u, v. The same thing equals to a, u, b, v plus some h tilde of u, v. And now in order to control this, this behavior of this guy here, I have to relax a little bit the derivative, the, 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 the norm that I'm considering here. Well, for simplicity, let me just assume that I consider the C1 norm. So where the C1 norm of this H tilde is smaller than epsilon. Okay? And the idea of proof of this is just seeing f of x, y as a small perturbation of f of x which it actually is, because you can write f of x, y as f of x composed to psi y composed to psi f of x minus 1. And if f of x is very close to y, this is almost the inverse of this. So this is very close to the identity. And if you have a control on the C2 norm of this, and this is very small, you can have a control on the C1 norm of this composition. Okay? Good. So these are the charts that make F itself look like a hyperbolic matrix. And I want to take advantage of this to, to construct uh, invariant manifolds. So how do we construct invariant manifolds? If you have taken classes in hyperbolic dynamics, you might have heard about the graph transform method. So it is exactly the graph transform method that I'm going to apply now. So the graph transform method. And what is the graph transform method? Well, I just showed to you that f of x, y is close to a hyperbolic linear map. So what happens if you come so let's say that we are here in R2, and f of x, y is a map from R2, from a subset of R2 to R2. And let us say here that the, parallel, the, the horizontal is the stable direction, the vertical is the unstable direction. So what happens if I get an unstable curve here? So what do I mean by an unstable curve is, let us say that an unstable curve is the graph of a function that is very parallel, that is almost parallel to the vertical direction, okay? And a stable curve is the same thing for the horizontal direction. So what happens if you get an unstable curve and you apply f of x, y? Well, if I didn't have this arrow term here, what would happen is that this thing here would stretch vertically and would be a little bit closer to the y-axis, right? Well, the error term doesn't change the qualitative behavior of this. So what actually happens when you iterate this curve under f of x, y is that you go all the way from the top to the bottom like this, right? And the same thing happens if you get a s curve here. So let me get an s, oops. Get an S curve here. What is it? It is the graph of a function that is, uh, whose graph is almost parallel to the S direction. Formally, you can require conditions on the function 
that you are considering, this function has to have Lipschitz constant at most one. That's what you require to define an S-curve. So if you pre-iterate pre this by f of x, y, what you get is a curve that goes all the way, di da all the way down from the left to right, like this, right? And what is the graph transform? What is the graph transform method? It's just, uh, uh, I'm going to analyze the map that is sending horizontal curves here, almost horizontal curves here to almost horizontal curves here, and almost vertical curves here to almost vertical curves here. So if, so let me introduce a notation. As you see, in order to consider f of x, y, and for f of x, y to have this hyperbolic behavior, I have to assume that f of x is close to y. But to do the same thing for the inverse, I would have to assume that x is close to f minus 1 of y. So I'll give a name for this. So we'll write psi x. So we'll write an edge from psi x to psi y if exactly these two conditions hold. So the distance of f of x to y is smaller than delta, and the distance of f minus 1 y to x is smaller than delta. And when you have these two conditions, then you can get this behavior for u curves and the other behavior for s curves, all right? So these two maps are called the graph transforms. So the stable graph transform of whenever you see these two properties here, you can consider the stable graph transform, is the map, let me give x, f of x, y, s, that gets an s curve at y and sends to an s curve at x. And similarly, How does it send it? It sends applying the map f of x, y. Similarly, the unstable graph transform is the map f of x, y, u that gets a u curve at x and sends to a u curve at y. So what do I want with these maps? Well, the main property of them is the following. What happens if you consider now not only one u-curve, but two u-curves, and you iterate, and you apply this, the unstable graph transform? Well, again, this guy goes all the way from top to bottom. But what happens with the horizontal proximity of them? You are seeing a contraction in the horizontal direction. So you expect that these two curves are much closer than these two curves, right? So you expect to see some contracting property for these maps. This actually holds. So the main property of the graph transforms which comes from the hyperbolicity is that they are contractions. Well, and in order to say that something is a contraction, I should say what is the distance that I'm considering. When you look at the space, for example, of S curves at X, each S-curve is the graph of a function, right? So you can consider the distance between two S-curves just as the, for example, the C0, the C1 norm, or actually the C0 norm of the functions defined in the graphs. So for each, for each curve, you have a function. Functions, you can consider distances. So this is what defines the distances in these spaces, in the spaces of S-curves and U-curves. And with this distance, these two guys are contractions, okay? 
All right. So what I want to do right now, remember yesterday that the idea of symbolic dynamics is instead of describing the orbit of a point, I want to describe some sort of a, where these orbits of point belongs to. So what I want to do now is that I want to consider a sequence of points satisfying these two properties. And given the sequence of points, I want to come up with a new point whose orbit, her orbit is shadowing exactly this fixed sequence of points. So what do I mean by that? Well, this is x minus 1, this is x0, this is x1. And if I have a sequence of points such that the distance of the image of this to this is smaller than delta, and the same for the inverse here, and so on, then I want to find a point x, I want to find a point x whose orbit is always belonging to this small rectangle around xi, okay? Okay, so let me give a name for the sequence of points. So a pseudo orbit is a sequence xn such that, well, since I already introduced the notation, I'm going to use it. Psi xn goes to psi xn plus 1 for every n in z. Okay? Yes. Well, the s, yeah, no, the, I, can, I can tell you that the, yes, exactly. Yes, and I get rid of it. I just delete it. It goes all the way down from one side to the other. I just delete it, and I see what remains inside the small rectangle. And how do I iterate this again? Well, I forgot about this. I iterate it again. It goes a little bit all the way to the top and to the bottom. I delete it, and I keep doing that. Okay? So I just see at the, small, at the scale epsilon. Again? An S-curve is just the graph of a function whose Lipschitz constant is at most 1. When you apply this map f of x, y, the image of this goes to something that is beyond this rectangle. So I'm defining what a map is. It takes an S-curve, and if I apply f of x, y, it goes all the way beyond, beyond these boundaries. I delete these boundaries, and I say that the image of my S-curve is this, is what remains inside the box, OK? I get rid of what is outside. OK, so given a pseudo orbit, we can consider the following limits. Observe that if I want my point to be following the itinerary of this pseudo orbit, well, if I look at the time xn, time n, f of n of x should be inside this small rectangle, right? So what happens if I look at xn minus 1? Well, it, fn minus 1 of x should be inside this rectangle. So I know that if I iterate f of xn minus 1 xn to the inverse, the image of this remains here. So in other words, what I want to convince you is that if I consider an S-curve here and I apply the graph transform method, it should come to an S-curve here containing this point. So I'm trying to recover what should be the property of this point here. Well, it should be in S-curves all the way in, in all the charts that I'm considering. So because of this contracting property, I can actually try to find what is the horizontal direction of the point that I'm aiming at. What is the, the horizontal direction that the point that I am in at? I'm going to define as the stable admissible manifold of my sequence xn, psi xn. And how do I do? I take advantage of the contracting property of this. So I go to the future, time n, and I look at any 
S curve at position N. And I start to pre-iterate this with respect to the stable graph transform. So I go from Xn to Xn minus one by applying this. Then I go all the way to X zero, X one. Each of these guys is a contraction. So you expect that this limit exists. And actually this limit exists and it does not depend on the choice of S curves that you are considering in the future. So this limit exists and it exists for some and actually for any choice of S curves Bsn at Xn for n greater than or equal to zero. So what I just defined actually only depends on the future. And what it is, it is an S curve in the position zero. And it tells me what is the position, the horizontal position of the point that I'm looking at. I'm trying to, to construct. So by the same reason, I could define also the VU of the sequence. And what do I do? I go all the way to the past. I get a U curve. And then I start to iterate the graph transform, the unstable graph transform forward. So I come from Xn to Xn plus one, U, dot, 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 up to F, X minus one, X zero. And I take the limit as N goes to minus infinity. So this limit exists for some and actually for any choice of U curves at Xn and smaller than or equal to zero. Okay? So how do I get a point that is following exactly the itinerary of this pseudo orbit? I have an S curve and I have a U curve. So I just get the intersection. is a point that follows, that shadows the pseudo orbit Xn. Okay, so I think I have 10 minutes. I think it's enough. So what am I going to do now? Now I want to pass to a finite set of Lyapunov charts such that when I look at the space of all pseudo orbits generated by this finite set of Lyapunov charts, I am able to, to, by applying this method here, to recover all points of the manifold. So this is what I'm going to call here coarse graining. And how do you do that? Well, you fix a delta prime much smaller than delta. It usually depends on the Lipschitz constant of your diffeomorphism. And take a delta prime dense finite set of vertices of points in N. Okay? So I have a delta prime dense subset of M. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to consider all the Lyapunov charts at these points. So define an oriented graph G equals to VE where the set of vertices is exactly all the Lyapunov charts centered at points of my dense subset and the edges are the allowed transitions from Psi X to Psi Y. What do I mean? Whenever the image of this is delta close to this and vice versa, I write an edge from this guy to this guy, okay? This one? Uh, 
so what happens is that the 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 passing the the, no, the Lyapunov chart itself is two Lipschitz. So if you know that on R two you are close to X n, when you apply it, when you apply the Lyapunov chart, what you will actually get is this image here. F of n of x is close to x n. It's an actual orbit. X is a point defined like this. Yes, but because of the invariance of these guys, what happens with f of x it is going to be the intersection of stable and unstable as well. Okay? Okay, so what I want to do now is that what, happen, what, what remains to, to be done? Well, we already constructed an oriented graph and we con can consider the topological Markov shift defined by it. But in order to get a symbolic model, we need a coding. The coding is actually given by this equality here. So um, let sigma to be the topological Markov shift associated to G. And I'm going to define the map pi from sigma to m by doing exactly that equality over there. So if you have a sequence of charts like this, or an actual pseudo orbit, how do you define the point that you want to get in m? Well, you consider the Vs intersected with the Vu. Okay? And what are the main properties of this map pi? Well, pi is surjective. Why? Because if you want to, to do something like this, or if you want to, to realize this as a point x, what do you do? So if x belongs to m, you find an xn in x such that the distance of xn to x, to f of n of x, is smaller than delta prime. You can do that because you know that x is delta prime dense. Then you observe that this xn defines a pseudo orbit, and because you have this proximity here, the intersection of, two, of these two guys has to be x. Because this uniquely defines, so this intersection is the only point that is delta close or delta close to this x ends for all times, okay? So the second property is that pi is an extension of the map f, so pi composed to sigma is equal to f composed to pi. So our hope is exactly to find that this pi is the symbolic model that you are aiming at, but unfortunately, Pi is highly infinite to one in general. So pi is usually infinite to one. Why? Try to imagine what would happen. So what, what it means to, to try to check finiteness to one. You fix a point in the manifold and you try to look at all sets of points x, n for which this intersection here is equal to x, right? If by any chance you had here two options for xn, then you would have uncountably many sequences, uncountably many pseudo orbits for which this intersection is x. So if this happens, holds for two, points on x, then the pre-image of x is uncountable. 
For each position, I have two options. So this is not the map that we are looking at, that we are aiming to construct. It is highly infinite to one in general. So what do we do? What we do is, is that we consider a refinement, and this is the last step of the construction. So it is a Bow and Sinai refinement. And the idea is that even though pi is infinite to one, it defines a cover of my manifold by good subsets. So what we consider is that let Z be a family of sets ZV, where V belongs to the vertex set. And what is the element ZV? So above, you have good Markov properties because you are in a symbolic space. So what, we are, what I'm going to do is that I'm consider all zero cylinders above and I'm going to project them below. So Z of V is going to be all the images pi of V underline, and remember that this is an element of sigma, yeah, which I'm going to write now, such that V is a sigma, and V zero is the vertex V that I'm fixing. So for each vertex I have a subset like this, this is a subset of M. This gives me a cover of M, right? It has a symbolic Markov property because it inherits this Markov property from above. But it is not a disjoint code. It is not a disjoint, yeah, it is not a partition of M. So how do I get rid of non-trivial intersections? So for all Z, Z prime, and Z, we partition, or we dynamically partition Z as follows. So I have subsets like this, and I want to get rid of non-trivial intersections. So in order to have the Markov property, what I'm going to do is that whenever I see these non-trivial intersections, I'm going to divide Z as follows. You look at the stable boundary of Z prime and you extend it all the way, and you do the same for the stable, stable and unstable. So whenever you see this, you just cut Z into four pieces, like that. And formally, what you have to do is that one element, one of the elements of this partition is going to be the set of points whose stable piece does not intersect Z prime, but unstable does. This one is the set of points whose stable curve and unstable curve do not intersect Z prime, and so on. So that's why I say that they are dynamically defined, okay? You look at the stable and unstable fibers of the point inside the Z, and you see which of them intersect Z prime. According to that, you divide Z into four pieces. So you have many partitions for Z. As you run over Z and Z prime here, you can consider the finest partition, or the, the coarsest partition that refines all of these guys here. So call this partition. E Z Z prime. This it is finite. Why? Because the vertex set is finite, right? My subset X is finite. Yeah. So let R to be the partition that refines all of E Z Z prime as Z, Z prime run over Z. So the claim is that this is the partition that we are aiming to construct. So this partition has the Markov property. And I know that I haven't defined this, but if you came yesterday for the exercise class, I did define it. 
And one of the exercises was that whenever you have a partition with the Markov property, you can define a symbolic coding, and it defines a new topological Markov shift, which I'm going to call sigma hat, sigma hat, and a new coding, pi hat, from sigma hat to m, and the triple sigma hat, sigma hat, pi hat, is a symbolic model for F. So in summary, what I did today. First step was to consider systems of coordinates that see F as a small perturbation of a hyperbolic linear map. Then I took advantage of that to consider graph transforms. What are graph transforms useful for? They are useful to allow you to construct a first candidate for a symbolic model. I constructed a, a topological Markov shift and a coding. But this map pi, although it is surjective and it intertwines the dynamics of f and sigma, it is usually not finite to one. And when it's not finite to one, I'm not happy. So what do I do? Well, nevertheless, it induces not a partition below, but a cover that has the Markov property. And once you have a cover with the Markov property, you can apply a refinement procedure in order to destroy non-trivial intersections and get actually a Markov partition, a partition with the Markov property. This new partition is going to give you a new topological Markov shift and a new coding. And this new triple here is going to be the symbolic model that you are looking for, okay? So I think today I'm going to stop for now, tomorrow we are going to try to apply the same idea for the case of non-uniform hyperbolic surface diffeomorphisms, and we are going to be faced with the difficulties that in general, contrary to here, here everything varies continuously. In the non-uniform hyperbolic case, everything only varies measurably. So we have many problems, many difficulties that we are going to encounter, and we are going to have to adapt the definitions all the way. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.